Um, okay, so I'll be talking today about three um, major suggestions. The first is um, to adopt an asset orientation. The second is to seek efficiencies in our work. And the third is to observe. And I'll argue that each of these are particularly important right now um, as we recover from the pandemic. So first I'll talk about adopting an asset orientation. Um, so the language that a lot of us are hearing around um, the COVID um, recovery, uh, terms like slide and lost and kids are behind and the cliff and the chasm um, have a sort of a negative tone to them and probably aren't going to result in the best kinds of attitudes we wanna have toward children in our teaching. So I suggest avoiding that language if possible. Um, what we wanna do is accelerate and intensify our uh, children's learning. Uh, Dr. Ernest Morrell at the University of Notre Dame it reminds us that the children have done nothing wrong. So wanting to keep a positive um, attitude and stance toward the kids as much as we can. Um, I have been hearing a lot of statements of, you know, kids have learned nothing the last nine months or kids have learned nothing the last year. And, you know, I think it's time, it, it's worth taking a little time to reflect on the fact that that's not the case, right? Humans learn, they learn all the time. Uh, they learn in lots of different settings and maybe they haven't learned what they would have learned if they were in school, but they have learned many things, including the ability to live through a once in a hundred year um, pandemic. So um, just kind of trying to remember to keep that asset orientation in this time. Collaborators and I um, carried out a, a project a few years ago in which we took a lot of different studies that had compared exemplary or highly effective teachers of literacy to teachers of literacy who are more average or, or mediocre or atypical or typical. Um, and what we looked for is what are some of the common themes that we see across these studies in terms of things that particularly good teachers of literacy do or exemplary or uh, highly effective teachers do. And one of the things that we found is that exemplary teachers tend to be more positive. They tend to be enthusiastic, curious, um, to have lots of praise and encouragement for, for children. And so that's a, a good piece, I think, to keep in mind uh, relative to this asset orientation idea. Um, exemplary teachers also foster success. Um, they tend to have very clear expectations for children and high expectations for children. And then they provide the scaffolding and the modeling and the instruction necessary for children to meet those high expectations. Exemplary teachers also teach for equity, which means they don't give every single student the exact same instruction. Rather, they adjust the instruction based on children's needs and strengths with the goal and the expectation that they will get every child to whatever benchmark or goal they've set. The second major um, point I'll make are, is around seeking efficiencies. So again, returning to our synthesis of research on highly effective teachers of literacy, one of the things you see with those teachers is that their teaching tends to be characterized by a very brisk pace of instruction. They have very clear routines, they just don't waste time, um, and their kids don't waste time, and so they pack more into a day, and that's probably part of why we see higher growth and higher achievement in their classrooms. So using time well has always been, of course, important, but I think we could all agree that using time well might be more important now than it ever uh, has been for us in our education system. So you really wanna be on the lookout for time wasters that are occurring in your classroom or in the classrooms you're coaching um, or in the schools or districts that you um, consult with or administrate. Um, so for example, um, morning work, uh, is often, uh, if you look at it and scrutinize it from a research perspective, not very um, productive for children's learning. Um, worksheets, there's just no evidence that worksheets um, foster growth or uh, student achievement, so they're not a very good use of time. Um, word searches um, are something I see far too often in classrooms. Again, no evidence that uh, word searches improve um, reading or writing achievement. Um, you know, a lot of these managerial issues, taking attendance, um, parts of calendar time that are really repetitive and, and no longer uh, needed for kids. 
Um, you know, these detailed picture walks where kids spend more time looking at every picture in the book than they do actually reading print. Also not good for um, kids' uh, literacy development. Giving kids time to read independently when they are not yet at a point where they can read independently um, is probably also not the best use of their time and so on. So looking for those, um, those time wasters is a really important um, idea. Another point around efficiency is that we want to look for those opportunities where we can get more bang for our buck or uh, feed two or more birds with one hand. Um, so for example, um, lately in particular, it seems as though um, there's a tendency to break foundational skills up into more and more separate and discrete parts. But actually what research points us to is the reciprocity and interrelationship among foundational skills. So we wanna look for opportunities where we're, for example, at the same time, both developing phonemic awareness and fostering knowledge of letter sound relationships or more technically and correctly grapheme phoneme relationships. Um, and you can see the practice guide um, that you'll hear more about later uh, for more guidance on that point. Another idea is around um, trying to both build knowledge, for example, in science and social studies, and develop literacy, for example, through developing knowledge of text structure, text features, application of uh, comprehension strategies, and so on. There's been some messaging um, out there to suggest that you sort of choose between knowledge and uh, strategy instruction, instruction about text, but that's not of what the research finds at all. Rather, um, much of the productive instruction simultaneously develops knowledge and um, teaches about texts and about strategies. So, um, and more information uh, on your slide about a very important um, example of feeding two or more birds with one hand uh, around integrating reading and writing. Again, many schools will have a separate time of the day for reading as for writing, but um, there is growing evidence that when we take a, an approach where we're doing reading and writing in a more integrated fashion and not letting one or the other absolutely dominate, we do see higher growth um, for students. Another point I want to make about seeking efficiencies is that we really want to orient ourselves to spending the least amount of time that's needed to develop any particular knowledge strategy or skill. Um, so I'm a bit concerned um, that I'm seeing in, in some places what seems like a race to spend more and more time on foundational skills. Like we're spending 60 minutes a day. Well, we're 75 minutes a day. Well, we're 90 minutes a day. The thing to understand here, and here I'm, I'm defining foundational skills um, as in the Common Core State Standards as being a phonological awareness, uh, letter sound relationships or phonics more broadly and word recognition, print concepts and fluency, um, that really the orientation I uh, suggest we take is, is sort of the opposite. It's a name that tune approach. Um, so for those of you familiar with name that tune, you know that somebody might say, I can name that tune in nine notes. And the other person says, I can name that tune in seven notes. And that's really the orientation I suggest we take around instruction. What's the least amount of time you can spend and get every student to where you need them to be? So what you're looking for there is efficiency and intensity in a brisk pace of instruction, as opposed to how can I spend more and more and more and more minutes on, on the same um, topic. Uh, it's really quality over quantity um, and keeping that mindset, I think will be important now more than ever. As you're seeking efficiencies, um, it won't surprise you to hear that I think you should try to um, really privilege practices with a strong research base. And so on your screen, you'll see a number of examples of resources with that um, strong research base. And my final point is that we really wanna be observing uh, right now. Um, always that's been important, but more important now because kids will be coming to us and are coming to us with, in such different places with respect to their strengths and their needs in literacy and where they are uh, in their development of each area of literacy. So um, again, I wanna point us to those exemplary teachers. Um, exemplary teachers use observation and assessment to inform their instruction. Um, and they do so more than more typical teachers. They don't group kids the same way for the whole year. They form and reform groups throughout the year and design lessons to meet students' particular needs. And they're responsive to students. So they learn about students' cultural and linguistic backgrounds. They learn about their interests, strengths, and needs, and they design instruction accordingly. 
Finally, it won't surprise you, therefore, to know that exemplary teachers spend more time on small groups and in individual instruction than they do in whole group instruction um, and than they do compared to other teachers uh, around literacy so that they can really take advantage of what they're learning from observing and assessing and tailoring instruction. So to sum up, I've offered three um, suggestions or recommendations for teaching in tier one in this uh, pandemic. Uh, one is to adopt an asset orientation. A second is to look for efficiencies in any way that we can. And the third is to make sure that we are observing and responding to individual students' needs.